We have David Gavel today, and uh, he's going to tell us the story about fire and haze. Uh, as you may all know, that last year was not an end. El Nino year, but uh, fire was raging again in the central part of Sumatra, especially Rio province. Uh, we flew there and um, <clears throat> David is going to tell us what's happened and uh, how much has been burned, what is the implication for health and emission of greenhouse gases. So David, time's yours. Oh, well, I think it's... Is it working? Okay. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Okay, uh, so um, I think I'll try to improvise today because I just found out today that there's no PowerPoint presentation, so it's just me talking and you guys listening and giving me feedback and questions. Okay, so, um, yes, so um, last year when the... Um, when, uh, when, uh, when fire and haze hit the headlines in June 2013, um, uh, Agus and I decided to, uh, you know, to, to jump on the occasion to, um, to take the opportunity to actually to try to, to map and understand the problem. Uh, so um, we, um, we looked at satellite imagery and we, we started mapping the areas that had been burned and uh, what, was the, what was the vegetation that had burned and we've looked at uh, the influence of rainfall and so on. And so, um, Eventually, we um, submitted a paper um, together with Daniel and, and other co-authors, and and so now I think what what, what you've probably read in the in the newspapers is that you've probably read about forest fires, and when we think about forest fires, we think about these these huge you know like like fires, crown fires, you know, gigantic flames, you know, life-threatening fires, like the sorts you'll see in places like in the Mediterranean or, or in California, maybe Australia, where we've got these really life-threatening fires that you know, threaten to destroy houses and kill people. Now, um, last year's fires are nothing like this. They're actually, it's actually quite safe. You can actually drive through or walk through these, through these fires. And, um, and you, you see the occasional flame here and there, but really the, 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 the these fires are really smoldering fires. They're actually fires on those peatlands where they generate a lot of smoke, but they don't really threaten your life directly. In fact, we've seen fires coming all the way up to the, side, to the roadside, and we could drive through them. We've seen these fires also burning all the way up to, um, um, you know, in villages and people, you know, running about their business, daily lives, and not feeling threatened about it, uh, at least in a directly. Uh, so th this, these are the fires that we're seeing now in, 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 in Ria, what we've seen last year in 2013 and what we've seen also at the, er the early part of 2014. So they're very different from the fires you might be thinking of, you know, of these huge flames, oh, we've got to run away because, you know, it, it's, it, it's about to kill us. No, this is very different. However, um, uh, it doesn't mean that they're not a problem. They generate an enormous amount of smoke, an enormous amount of greenhouse gases. Uh, we've started to put some figures, um, but uh, they are huge uncertainties. We don't know how much methane really is being released from these fires. We don't really know how much aerosols are being released that are more threatening for, 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 the, for, the, for the health of people um, over the long term. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I've lost my thread here. So these fires are, never, are an important problem, and they create also a lot of um, diplomatic uh, uh, problems between the countries that are involved, between Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, and so on. And so um, f in the research that we did, we've looked at, we've tried to understand the causes of these fires. So we've, first we map them, we, we look at what's burned, and we find that actually it's not forest that's burning, it's areas that's already been deforested. We find that it's primarily peatlands that are burning. But we also find that there is a, a climatic element that these fires are only occurring during uh, periods of drought or um, um, it, during um, periods of um, um, where we are, uh, where we're actually experiencing less rain. I'm not necessarily talking of severe droughts, but I'm talking of um, 
months during the year where there's less rain than, than usual. However, these are not really the causes of the fire. What the causes are, it, they're actually, it's people. People are actually setting fire to the land. And um, we, we know why, because of agricultural development. But we don't know the full story. Um, uh, we think that um, a lot of the problem is um, overlapping claims over land ownership over a given area. We think that if several, many groups of people claim an area as their own, then they will, there will be more fires because they will be using fires to claim you know, ownership over, over this land or, or to use it as a weapon against the other group that's also um, claiming that piece of land. We know that there are cases of this, but we don't really know whether this is really the, 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 the whole story, whether they are the major cause of fires. So we're hoping to be able to do research in the future to be able to understand who is driving fires. Are they primarily local communities or migrants coming in with the backing of communities or the large companies or perhaps a group in between that's what people call the mid-level investors who are people who have got capital and who are ready to invest in land clearing for agricultural development. So we still don't know these things. But what we know for sure is that there are problems of overlapping claims over land ownership. And what that brings is that it brings confusion. It creates a problem is when you try to understand with the maps who is burning, when you look at the land use maps and you overlay them with the burned areas, you don't know for sure who is doing the burning. Even though, say, you find that a lot of the burning is in a concession controlled by a company, well, you don't really know whether, that's, whether the company is, has been doing the burning. Maybe, it's, maybe there's a conflict with the community or, or, or anything else that we don't know of. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, pretty much uh, uh, the, 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 the story so far. Um, we don't know, we don't know who is actually doing the burning. Um, we think that everyone's doing it at every time, at uh, a different time, but uh, we still need to understand the complexity of the relationships amongst all the land use actors to really understand who is more responsible than, than others. Now what's happened last year, is, as Daniel said, is that last year was a unusual in the sense that we started seeing huge fires outside of an El Nino year. Now I told you before that um, the fires are actually occurring during periods of drought and they were last year when the fires hit in June and also in February of 2014. It, the, 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 the month during, the, the, during which time the fires occurred was a dry month. There was a drought. But this was not an El Nino year in the sense that Overall, the year was wet, but we had like this one single month of drought, which was sufficient to start the fires. And if we look back 20 or 30 years ago, this was not the case. When the forest, when the, the environment was more pristine, and those, de those peatlands that we're looking now, that are burning now, were not degraded, one month of drought was not enough to start fires. But now what we're seeing is that because of all this degradation, these lands have been de degraded and if you walk there at noon it will be very, very hot. And because peat lands are this kind of young coal, they're easily flammable. All it takes is a few weeks of no rain or little rain uh, for, for fires to start. And so we think that we're actually going to see more and more fires in the future. And when we think of Riau, and everybody says, oh, Riau is an area where there's always been fires, but actually it's not true. If you look at 97, 98, which, which is the reference year for uh, fires in Indonesia, Riau did not experience a lot of fires. At the time, peatlands were not as degraded as they are now. At the time, in 97, the fires were in southern Sumatra, in central Kalimantan, east Kalimantan, and now we're also seeing Riau becoming an area where we're seeing more and more fires. So we think that it, 
the problem is actually going to get worse because, because there's a lot of degraded peatlands. By degraded peatlands, I mean areas that have no vegetation cover anymore, that have been drained, so they're dry. And all, now, all it takes now is a few weeks of no rain and you've got the fires starting. Also because there's, on the other side, people coming in, migrants coming in, people seeking land, and so they're using fire to clear the land for agriculture, but also perhaps as a weapon to clear land in areas where the, the, the land use is not sure. So I think I'll stop here. Do you want to tell us about the, the emission of greenhouse gases, uh, especially relative to the national emission? So yeah. that people have the idea how much okay. has been burning, how much has been burning. So we, we, we did the calculations. So we found last year in 2013 in June that within one week, um, an area of about 160,000 hectares had burned and 90% above 90% of that was on peatland. And then we worked out the emissions, we found 171 teragrams emitted by those 160,000 hectares of land that had burned in Ria within one week. And 170 teragrams is equivalent to 5 to 10% of Indonesia's annual emissions, overall emissions. So that was, that's pretty huge because we're seeing a one week event emitting five to ten, one week event in just, um, it was like less than one percent of the area of Indonesia emitting one to ten, five to ten percent of Indonesia's overall annual emissions. So this, this, this is huge. This is a huge event. Yeah. Good, thank you. Uh, well, that's the story about the fire in 2013, which in climatological terms, sounds like an anomaly. El Nino is an anomaly, but it was not an El Nino year. But such a, a scale of, of devastation in terms of emission happened in the non-El Nino year as well. So what's going to happen if it is an El Nino? Is it because uh, the, the substance which was burned was peat? Was it because something else? Suddenly, people are flocking to this province to develop the land. So to um, perhaps uh, explore further issues, I would like you to ask David uh, any question related to your work maybe or anything you are curious about. Jacob? I'm curious to hear whether using time series there's any opportunity to look at the 2013 event and think about whether these were any indication that these were indi lots of individual incidences of fire versus just a few that then spread? Is there any scope to look at that within that, even that, you know, those sh few short weeks to look at the kind of fire emerging from lots of distinct points versus coming from two or three main ones and then spreading across the landscape? Um, we, we are um, actually, Agus and I were thinking of a, a, a new kind of analysis where we, we've also got fire data. So we have these burned areas mapped. But um, within these burned areas, we've got data on a daily basis. So we could look at the progression of fire of, you know, on a day-to-day on -day basis. And so the idea would be to see where is it starting from. Whether it's, you know, uh, for example, starting outside of concession and moving in the concession, or whether there's a, a wind element, whether it follows the wind pattern, and you know, if the winds were flowing, were um, <coughs> blowing to, to the east, are uh, we also seeing the fires kind of spreading to the east, which would indicate that fires were you know, also being uh, made worse by, by winds. But, so we, 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 we're exploring this now, but what we all, we, we've just started, I've actually just started doing this this weekend, we've uh, looked at the fires for 2014, looking at the same method as last year, over the same area. Also in an attempt to build a time series, uh, to, to, to gather more information on these fires over time and to be able to try to better understand who's doing the burning. So one idea that we had, for example, is um, the companies are saying, well, we're not using fires, even within their concessions. But a year on, are we 
seeing um, development by the companies, for, 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 you know, uh, the areas that burned last year, are they now being, you know, planted um, uh, by, by the industry? And with the satellite imagery, we can see it because they are using these grid-like patterns um, <coughs> that um, um, smallholders do not use. Um, but um, in the 2014, I was just doing this this weekend, I, I, I was really um, amazed because we found massive fires within the acacia plantations of where we were last year. I mean, compared to last year, what we've seen in the, the fires in 2014 were like destroyed a lot of uh, productive acacia. Um, and to the point that I emailed uh, the, one of the guys from Sinanamas Forestry who's, who's you know, responsible for these plantations, he hasn't replied. And we said, you know, what's happening there? Because now this is not just, this is huge. We're like, essentially the whole concession has, been, has burned. <clears throat> so by building these time series, and we're also trying to go back and obviously we have a limitation for the imagery, and, but we found some really good imagery for year 2005 over the area where we're working now. And 2005 is a, is a, is a key date because there's, that's, um, there was a push for, for more acacia plantations. For, there was a push for more clearing of forests for acacia plantations. And so we're, we're, trying, to, we're, we're trying to expand the time series to, to try to better understand uh, the, the situation on, on, on the ground. It's really trying to understand the who, you know, the, the who question. Because I don't think that any legislation enforcement will actually work before we actually can answer who's who's responsible and they're all blaming each other companies say well it's the smallholders and the smallholders well it's the company so we're like we don't really know and and so yeah, I don't think can locate where but cannot identify who it's more difficult but we can get we can get clues we can get clues yeah any other questions yes uh, are you really tell the Are you able to tell on your scale about Sweden agriculture and the contribution that that might play? Like proper Sweden agriculture, like, like slash, slash and burn. And burn. Um, I I don't think it exists in Riau in the sense that the land is already um, claimed pretty much by by somebody. There's a lot of migrants coming from other provinces, and there's a lot of. Um, Industrial development. There's, there's, you know, there's infrastructures being built. There's, uh, there's oil and gas there as well. Um, it originally, it's not a. It was a region that was like the the local communities were more. Um, they lived more on the coastline. They did not live in the interior because those peatlands were never really favoured by anybody uh, for agriculture. It's a recent phenomenon. By re by recent, I mean it really started in the 1990s. I've even heard that local or migrants, so now they keep burning the, the, the peat so that they can reach the, top, the, the mineral soil and start growing rice. So in, in a sense, this peatland is, no one likes these peatlands because they are too acidic. And I think, um, I mean, obviously they found a way to grow oil palm on it because there's a lot of oil palm being grown. Um, but um, by draining the soil and by also bringing extra you know soil from outside also for acacia they use um, one kind of acacia which is tolerant uh, which is um, not mandium but classicarpa which is a kind of for pop and paper which is one kind of acacia that will grow on on um, on uh, on peatlands but for the small farmers they do oil palm or they do like pineapple because it's it, it's tolerant to acidic soils but I don't think that there's any slash and burn in, in the sense that you're. you're Let's see, hands there, Carmen. Um, you mentioned that some of the fires have gone too far and some of them have gone too far. Do you think that there's. So, some of the fires are conflict fires, which I guess are intended to escape, and other fires are for sort of more constructive purposes to use the land. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about, are there any management practices then? Are there any like methods taken for those um, fires to aid, you know, agriculture to stop them escaping or, or not? I don't know. Um, I, I mean, what I can tell you is that uh, on peatlands, fire is forbidden. So any fires 
is, is illegal in that sense. Um, I, I mean, well, they also well, they use these canals. You see, they they drain. They use a lot of drainage canals to, to drain. So they like if you look at the plantations, they um, they they uh, organize plantations in grid-like systems, and the grids are actually these canals, and so the fire will tend to stop there. So when we see the 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 the, the, the burned areas, so often we see like a rectangle that's burned because the fire is actually stopped at the edge of the of the canal where the but I I wouldn't be able to answer your question in, in, in more specifically than that. In, in the old day they let it escape to claim the land and it is conflict. <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe the last one? presentation and sorry if I like came quite late and I don't know whether this has been talked by you or not but uh, could you please like describe more uh, about the, the the land use allocation not the actual but maybe the 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 the, 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 the jure land use allocation within those burn 100,000 hectares areas yes thank you so we're, we're talking the, the region of Riau. Um, so the, the, we've got um, a lot of oil palm, a lot of acacia. Acacia is primarily is actually I think 100% of the acacia plantations, which is essentially for for pot and paper, are controlled by uh, by the companies. Um, April, Sinan Mass Forestry, and um, APP, um, and. So we've, we've essentially we found that half of those 160,000 hectares were within concessions allocated for oil palm and acacia, concessions being areas given by the national government or the provincial government to companies to um, develop these industrial scale acacia or uh, oil palm plantations. We found half of them. Half of the burning was inside. Half of the burning was outside. And outside, well, this is this. This is outside. There's a lot of a lot of the land is still in what we call uh, production production forest land. So Hutan Produksi, which is controlled by the Ministry of Forestry here in in Jakarta, but. A lot of that land has already been cleared and has already been developed by agri for agriculture. Um, so um, this is one area of conflict or one you know element for conflict because it means that the local government has actually uh, supported the development of planta or of industri of agricultural plantations in areas. Um, that are controlled by the Ministry of Forestry and where it's not allowed. Um, because Riau does not have a lot of APL land, land dedicated for agriculture. Most of it is in production land. And in fact, the local government or the provincial government or district government, they would like to have the land use plans changed, but I think it's been going on for a few years and they have not yet reached a, an agreement with the national government. Now, so that's for outside. For, for the half of the burning inside, inside the concessions, so inside concessions for oil palm and acacia, so you could say, all right, so the companies are responsible for half of the burning, right? Because this is the area that they are controlling, that they have responsibility. This is the area that the companies are developing for the development of these industrial scale monoculture oil palm and acacia plantations. But what we found, um, in fact, Ellis did a lot of work on this, and we found this through remote sensing that a lot of areas in the concessions are actually not controlled by the companies themselves. Um, or not developed by the companies themselves. There's only so if you have an area, you know, this is your concession. Maybe half of it is planted, 
and the rest is not planted. But when we looked at the parcels, the land, the, 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 the arrangements of land parcels, we were able to determine that these areas that were not developed by the companies were likely to be occupied by communities or migrants or, or you know another group of people who are not the company themselves and we found a lot of burning in those areas inside the concessions which made us think well perhaps it means it's not the company who's really doing the burning in the concessions but the communities but then again we started thinking well perhaps the company is helping the community to do the burning for subsequently developing the area into an industrial so all these dynamics we, we don't know and we can't really apprehend them by satellite alone but to summarize half of the burning in the concession date in the concessions half outside that half in the concessions most of the burning was in areas that were not developed although we found a little bit also in the areas that were developed and in 2014 we actually found a lot more and outside the concessions um, it's Hutan Produksi land, it's APL land, it's a mix of both, but it's, we, sti we don't know because there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of uncertainties, you know, and there's a lot of um, uh, disagreements between the, between the district, provincial and national government. So that's... that's, right. that's, that's, that's so fire regimes change over time. In, in the late 90s, uh, only 2000, C4 and ECRAF made a consortium uh, looking at fire and it was obvious uh, one of the findings was that fire is not the problem. The problem is the haze. So, uh, but the haze itself is, is only a symptom. What would be the underlying causes, which is now growing and changing over time. Um, that was in the early 2000 and uh, now we are engaging a new fire project likely uh, in the near future we have a big uh, concept note for um, working with multiple donors so with that uh, thank you very much David and, and all the, the questions that you raised and it's been enriching uh, in terms of fire and knowledge and how to, to handle with this in the future thank you very much thank you